purpose of this event is to celebrate repositories that have done the work of digitizing black women's organizing records and personal records. Us. So please enjoy the programming that we have today. My name is Kesla Elmore. I am a dual title doctoral student in English and African American and Diaspora Studies here at Penn State. And I am a Dig Black Fellow with the Center for Black Digital Research and the Chair of Dig Digitized Black Women's Records Day with BWA. So I'm going to also invite my co-chair, Lauren Barnes, to give us a little bit more details. Thank you so much, Kesla. So I'm Lauren Barnes. I am also a graduate student at Penn State pursuing a dual title PhD in English and African American Studies and Diaspora Studies. Um, I was really excited to co-chair this event with Kesla and the rest of the BWOA team. And I would like to really shout out each of our BWOA Black Women's Organizing Archive members uh, right now. So as I call your name, if you could just stand up, give a little wave. Um, and we could recognize you for all of the hard work that you've put into this. So I'll start with our co-coordinators, Dr. Sabrina Evans. <laughs> and Yolanda Mackey. <laughs> and then we have Takina Walker. <laughs> and Carmen Wong. <laughs> we have Kendra Napier Fonash. <laughs> and Shawnice Reed. <laughs> Morgan Robinson, and Wendy Liz Martinez. And I'd also like to recognize all of the hard work that our co-director, Dr. Shirley Moody Turner, has put into this as well. Thank you. And our extended uh, BWA team with the Center for Black Digital Research, um, Gabby Sutherland, Lauren Cooper, and Sergio Carmona. So thank you to everyone um, for all, all of the work in making this happen. And this wouldn't be possible without our sponsors. Um, so a special recognition to the Center for Black Digital Research, um, a special recognition to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, Just Transformations, and also Dean Lang and the College of Liberal Arts. So thank you so much. Um, and now I will pass it over to Dr. Sabrina Evans to give a brief history of the Black Women's Organizing Archive. All right. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sabrina Evans, and I am an assistant professor of English at Howard University. I was also the inaugural BWA project coordinator and now serve as the first BWA um, Just Transformation Satellite Partner. Today, I'd like to provide an overview of BWA and share a little bit of its history. So founded in 2020, BWA, or the Black Women's Organizing Archive, seeks to bring together the scattered archives of 19th and early 20th century black women organizers, beginning with our current featured women, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, Mary Ann Shad Carey, Mary Church Terrell, and Anna Julia Cooper. The BWA project is a culmination of the work begun by the Anna Julia Cooper Digital Project and Douglas Day 2020 Transcribe Cooper, which partnered with the Moreland Spring Ground Research Center at Howard University to digitize and transcribe the Anna Julia Cooper collection there. Other partnerships with Archives Ontario and the Library of Congress have led to the digitization of Mary Church Terrell's and Mary Ann Shad Carey's papers in subsequent years. Beyond encouraging digitization and transcription of black women's archives, BWA creates web published directories, data visualizations, and digital maps that center black women's archival materials that too often have been obscured or subsumed under the collections of black male intellectuals or white abolitionists and reformers. To do this work, we collaborate with a team of graduate students, faculty members, librarians, archivists, digital humanities specialists, artists, poets, and community members. So thank you all for joining us today, whether in person or online. I'll now turn it over to our founding faculty director, Dr. Shirley Moody Turner, who will share some more about the significance of this work. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. 
Um, thank you all so much for being here today, and thank you again to the team for creating such a beautiful, beautiful event. Um, I'm Shirley Moody Turner. I'm the co-director of the Center for Black Digital Research with Dr. Gabrielle Foreman. Um, the center, which we call Dig Black, is home to the award-winning College Conventions Project, the Global Transcribathon, and Day of Love for Black History, Douglas Day, and the Black Women's Organizing Archive. We want to thank you all for joining us today to recognize and celebrate the work of repositories across the U.S. and Canada in stewarding, preserving, and making more accessible the papers and collections of 19th and early 20th century black women organizers and writers. The black women we come here to recognize today and the scores of others they worked with alongside created archives of their own words and writings. They wrote, they clipped, they edited, collected, and preserved their own and other black women's writings, speeches, stories, and lives. They documented and told stories and testified. In 1895, author, educator, journalist, and activist, Victoria Earl Matthews wrote, actually she warned, unless earnest and systematic effort be made to procure and preserve the transmission of our successors, the records, books, and various publications already produced by us not only will the sturdy pioneers um, produced by us, not only the sturdy pioneers who paved the way and laid the foundation for our race literature will be robbed of their just due, but an irretrievable wrong will be inflicted upon the generations that shall come after us. Their lives and documents, she continued, should be zealously guarded for the future use of their children. The print archives these women created helped show us who they were, the fullness of their lives, what it meant to do this work. They leave a record of their own lives, stories, and their critical fabulations, imagining a submerged past, envisioning a liberated future. We meet these print and digital collections as part of an archive of memory, and they direct us back to the place, to the land, to the spirit, to the community, and to the social relations of which the print archive is but one part. The poets, playwrights, activists, archivists, scholars, and educators joining us here today are the stars in a constellation that returns us to sites of memory to listen and remember to the stories these archives have to tell. I'm gonna turn it over to our BWA co-coordinator, Yolanda Mackey, um, and Lauren Barnes to shout out just some of the repositories around the country that are preserving and stewarding these collections. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Yolanda Mackey. I'm a, the co-project coordinator for the Black Women's Organizing Archive and a PhD candidate in English and African American Studies. I'm here today to talk about some of BWA's work. Over the years, BWA has facilitated the digitization efforts of 19th century black women community organizers. The first was in 2020 with Moreland Spingarn, where team members of the BWA team went to Howard to assist with digitizing Anna Julia Cooper's papers. In 2021, BWA members served as liaisons for the Douglas State team as we transcribed Mary Church Terrell's papers at the Library of Congress. And again in 2023, as we collaborated with Douglas Day in Archives Ontario to digitize and transcribe Mary Ann Shaw Carey's papers. In 2025, BWA looks forward to collaborating with her sister project, Douglas Day, again to transcribe the records and materials of Frances E. W. Harper that are housed at the Library of Congress. We hope that these partnerships demonstrate our commitment to making the work and intellectual contributions of 19th and early 20th century black women community organizers and activists visible and accessible to broader audiences. We want to take a moment to spotlight a few of our digitizing partners to showcase the types of records and materials that are available online. At Moreland Spingarn, there are poems and, po uh, poems and a program of Anna Julia Cooper's uh, play that she arranged and directed an evening with Virgil uh, 
that are highlighting here her classic, or her background in Latin and classics, but she's often not remembered as a poet or a play director, although she, was, although she saw them as powerful and necessary means of expression. We're excited today to be in conversation with poets, uh, scholars, playwrights, and educators. We also wanna take a moment to spotlight the materials available at the Library of Congress and Mary Church Terrell's papers. The first is a letter with Mary Church Terrell to her husband while she was attending the 1919 International Congress of Women in Zurich. She shares with her husband that she had the opportunity to speak with one of the largest crowds at the conference with a day's notice and in German. This is an example of the types of materials that are now available online through this collaboration. And of course, we want to take a moment to share the additional archives and repositories that have digital collections related to our featured women. Listed here, we have the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Houghton Library at Harvard University, Historical Society of Pennsylvania, Tulane University Special Collections Library, University of Detroit Mercy Archives, the Buxton National Historic Site and Museum, of course, Penn State University Libraries, and, National, and the National Museum of African American History and Culture Rare Books Collection at the Smithsonian Library. And lastly, we want to encourage you to use this QR code to check out our papers and collections on the BWA website, where you will find a directory of repositories for each of our featured women. And so now I'll turn it over to Lauren Barnes, who will share a little bit about our new digitization efforts. Thank you, Yolanda. So I'm really excited um, to share some information about the new digitization efforts that are happening all across the country, uh, all of the work that's being done to amplify black women's voices, uh, really exciting work. Um, and so our highlights are just a few of the exciting efforts and the work that are going on currently. Um, so I'll start with Emory University Libraries has a really exciting um, new digitization effort focused on the Barbara Chase Raboud papers. And this example is um, really focused on the African American Imprints Collection. The Schomburg uh, Center for Research in Black Culture at, with the New York Public Library um, has recently um, digitized an entire collection and an entire uh, book project. And so the picture book poetry book is now fully digitized, um, so it can be found online. It's open access, and it was originally published by Gertrude McBrown and um, by the Associated Publishers, Inc., and it was which was founded by um, Carter G. Woodson. So that's some of the really exciting work um, happening across the country. And we also have um, some highlights of the Tri-College Library's digital collections, which is comprised of Bryn Mawr, uh, Bryn Mawr College, Haverford College, Swarthmore College, and then in coordination with the Philadelphia Area Consortium of Special Collections Libraries, has managed the In Her Own Right project. And the In Her Own Right project um, has some really awesome albums, um, papers, essays, collections, and highlights African-American women's friendships. And then the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale University has digitized materials related to Mary Ann Chad Carey, and then also digitized um, materials related to Anna Julia Cooper. And we would love for you to follow us on Twitter uh, for more shout outs. We would really like to highlight any digitization efforts that are happening, amplifying the voices of black women, amplifying the archives of black women. And we also, um, a particular shout out to uh, Penn State Library Special Collections and the exhibit on black culture. Um, so that's really exciting work that's happening here as well. Thank you. I'll now pass it to Kesla who will review our agenda for the day. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, so I hope the energy is high because this is a celebration. So we want to get ready to get hear our speakers. Um, we have our opening keynote from Maida Giwa Jones. We have a coffee break, hopefully at 115. And then a round table, our artists, teachers, and archivists round table with Sharia Ben, Janelle Moore, and Jennifer Morris. And then we will have our closing reading from Dr. Damaris Hill. 
Okay, and so I'm going to introduce uh, Carmen Wong. She is a poet, a playwright, and a doctoral student in English and African American and Diaspora Studies here at Penn State. And she is a Dig Black Fellow and BWA member as well. So welcome, Carmen. Can you hear me now? <laughs> so let's run that back real quick. When I say digitize, you say black. Digitize. Digitize. Black. OK, OK, everyone's awake. OK. <laughs> Thank you again so much for joining us in this space. It is such an honor to stand before you, especially as I think about all the women who have occupied rooms before us. It is a pleasure for me to invite our keynote speaker, a profound curator of words, creative thinker, and genius poet, transcending trans traditional boundaries of literature, Dr. Maida Jones's writing often engages deeply with visual culture, all the while enriching our souls. She is the author of The Muse is Music, which was awarded honorable mention for the MLA William Sanders Scarborough Prize. Dr. Jones's current monograph in progress entitled Black Alchemy seeks to answer the question, how do black diasporic creatives attend to the legacy of slavery and global migration and its impact on notions of community, kinship, and freedom through research, autobiographical vignettes, and close analysis. She is an associate professor in the Department of English and Comparative Literature at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her research and writing has been supported by fellowships from the National Humanities Center, the Moreland Spingard Research Center at Howard University, the Carter G. Woodson Institute, and various others. All that said, Dr. Jones will always be my Howard University English professor and mentor, and now dear friend. Together, we co-wrote alongside our closing speaker for this event, Dr. Damaris Hill, The Furious Flower Syllabus, a free open access resource and curriculum designed to incorporate black poetry into classrooms of all ages. Her newest piece as of two weeks ago, okay, she's still working, is on Erica Hunt and Allison Starr and is published in The Fight and the Fiddle, which you can access online. In preparing for today's talk, I asked Dr. Jones what she would like people to know about her, and here is what she replied. My maternal grandparents had 10 children together, and we recently lost the first of what our family calls the top 10. My talk today is dedicated to Uncle Wilk, William Wilkerson. Please help me welcome Dr. Maida Jones. I use this mic? Yes, it's on. Awesome. So I'll set my timer and we'll get started. And thank you, Carmen. That is quite a thing to follow. I will aim to live up to that beautiful introduction. I will start and time myself. So first, I would like, before I begin my remarks and talk, to acknowledge that the Pennsylvania State University campuses are located on the original homelands of the Erie, the Harunasani, the Lenape, the Shawnee, the Sesquicamehanock, and um, nations. I come from um, where the Lumbee are in UNC uh, Chapel Hill, among others, and so I wanted to make sure that um, I began in the right direction because without land, we can't get to digital spaces, there has to be a home. 
for them, okay? And I brought physical books that are gonna come up in my talk, not to say that we need to go back to physical, but you'll see why um, in a minute. All right. Archive Drive, from limestone to headstone. So pictured here is, well, I won't tell you, somebody tell me, in that circle, who can say, you say, did you say, say black, what's picture there in that circle? The Smithsonian Natural, Air, that's right. If you, I mean, it's not like me asking if you know, lift every voice and sing. So I want to start. <laughs> that's the outside, right? Uh -huh. Here's the inside. And I, what I wanted to start with was um, because it's Women in History Month, because Digitized Black Women's Records Day coincides appropriately with that, because two years ago, the National Museum of um, the Black Sonian, as they call it, um, made the right decision in creating on its entrance. Um, um, not creating, but creating the space to hold um, Elizabeth Catlett, one of the many ways to celebrate the month, um, three of her sculptures. I have them here offering education, offering life, um, rejecting injustice because it's my argument in my presentation today that these three frames are frames through which all of the current women, whether it's Mary Church Terrell or Anna Julia Cooper or Frances Harper, um, all of the women that you are focusing on reflect those themes, right? And so it's a wonderful way to begin. Um, and the other thing, if you notice, I have is from their press release on long-term display as visitors enter the museum through Heritage Hall. I want us to think about entrances. How do we enter general, digital spaces? How do we enter archival spaces? What are the barriers or the openings that make those possible? So a little bit about Catlett, right? So Iowa awards its first MFAs um, in 1940. She's among them and also the first African-American woman to receive that. A little bit about Margaret Walker, poet, biographer, novelist, alligator, the first to win um, Yale Younger Series Poets Prize, right? You may see some other dates up there. 1915, they both were born in 1915, and I chose them because I wanted to think about other writers and artists who collaborate that are interlocutors with those that you focused on already and to make a case for why accessing, curating, collating their materials as well and putting them in conversation with them expands our understanding, expands our engagement um, with, uh, with them. And that's a, a piece of, of something that's not um, digitized, which is a letter that um, Margaret Walker is working that the um, Beinecke, and I'm not calling the Beinecke out, but that the Beinecke house, but it's not accessible on, um, online. So 1942, um, the other thing is that Walker and um, Catlett were roommates, right? So it's one of these things in terms of thinking about networks and forms of networks that are often um, uh, not, not necessarily known that I think digitizing the letters, the correspondences that you all are doing amplifies, right? So I wanted to make those intimate spaces connected so that you could see that. The next thing I will say, which is not on this um, slide at all, but in 1943, my mother was born. And in 1961, she graduated from Middick College and enrolled at University of Iowa Law School. Why do I make that point? The other, the other reason this is significant is what black women's organizing and digitizing of archives is doing is specifically trying to highlight not only the most prominent, right? But who else were you in conversation with, right? Um, by the time my mom went to Iowa for law school, she was still only one of six. So it's an important reminder not to get too comfortable with our first, right? Because there tends to be sometimes this, this people who are at their level, this idea that kind of we paved the way. How many times have we heard or used that cliche, we paved the way, and once that way is paved, that it's assumed to be a lot easier, but that's not always the case. Okay, so next. This is a work um, that is in the repository at Harry Ransom Center at University of Texas at Austin. I hope in the future that HRC and UT Austin will be a site, right, of curation and collaboration um, for you all at Penn State. The Limited Editions Book Club, this is 
has been sold out for quite some time. If you go online, you can only see pieces of it at different universities because some have like a handful of some of the folios, some have another handful. HRC had um, all of them and I began doing research at them when I was still faculty at, at um, UT Austin and I hadn't realized the riches, I didn't understand because you could look up and look online and see that it's available elsewhere. I didn't understand that availability is not the same thing as full access, right? And so that's another reason um, being able to see um, Margaret Walker's award-winning For My People, right, that book, but also the poem, her anthem poem that's often um, displayed, and Elizabeth Catlett's lithographs, right, that were illuminating that entire, um, entire suite. And this was um, created in 1992. So you're looking, just like the women that you all are studying, you're looking at an entire of work across decades of collaboration, of literary, of visual, of intellectual engagement that I think it's important um, to, to celebrate and acknowledge. So I wanted to pull out another um, uh, digital preservation site that you all are already familiar with, um, and a 600 page, which is why digitization is important, biography of Margaret Walker by none other than Dr. Mary Emma um, Graham. And so uh, I'm emphasizing that. I was also gonna emphasize uh, Furious Flower, but thank you, Carmen, since you um, did that. And since I am um, on the board, I didn't put them on my slides because I felt like that'd be too, that would be too self-referential. So here's the thing to think about archives. Remember I said entrances, I want us to think about how do we enter in digital spaces, how do we enter physical spaces, how do we enter what constitutes an archive. So the university celebrates, right, in 2017 Elizabeth Catlett Residence Hall, right? So a, the, imagine, right, the experience of walking in to a hall named after, plastered with on the walls, photographs, right, pieces of art, right, created by someone like Catlett, how that changes that space, right? Especially when you consider, it'll come out in the poem that I'm going to read in um, shortly, that Catlett was denied, and I'm, I wanna tell the story right. Catlett wasn't denied entrance to Carnegie Mellon University, she was admitted. When she got there, and they found out that she was black, she was then rejected. So she was already admitted based on her artistic genius, right? So if you read in the digital record, and sometimes it says she was denied admission and then she went to Howard University, but HU, you know, is no slouch. So, I mean, I'm like, we won with that one. But I was gonna say, it's important to tell those stories carefully, right? So this kind of thing, now, now Iowa gets to claim her, right? And claim her they do, but what's important about the kind of digital work we're doing and it's important to do is to not wait until she is you know celebrated and in collections all around the world before you do that okay so a few things when I start thinking about entrances this is one of the entrances to the hall what I wanted to point out here is like 12 stories high 303,000 square feet what's the thing that's normally used to, to kind of calibrate to count in archives, linear feet, right? So what is the strength and the reason the work of digitization is so important? We get beyond the ideal of scale and massiveness, right? Which increases accessibility for spaces that don't have that space, right? Or don't have those financial resources to have that access. So I have here, and this is another reason why digitization is important, you know, Good old Alice Walker is associated with purple <laughs> very often, right? You know, woman, what does she say? You all can complete the sentence, right? That um, uh, womanism is to feminism as lavender is to purple, right? But here's the deal. This version, right, of In Search of Our Mother's Gardens that precedes, right, um, the Womanist Prose Collection, I got access to only because it was digitized, right? I had read In Search of America as an undergrad, as a graduate student. It wasn't until um, we wanted a resolution, created a source book, digitized that material, made some of that material available online, and made a book that I realized and had access to the original photographs, right? And so you can't think about, like, if we don't, digitize not only the material, but all of visual cultural materials that are context for this work, then we miss seeing and we miss see black women's history, their legacies, and their archives. So sandstone to limestone. Why Catlett, 
right? So at the top of this, I um, placed it there. At the top of the stairs is a head of a man, right? That's the title. You're like, well, why did I pick a head of a man instead of a head of a woman? It's Digitized Black Woman's Day. Because remember when I showed you the Margaret Walker and the um, Elizabeth Catlett co co collaboration? Her last line in For My People in 1941 ends, let a race of men now rise and take control. When Barbara Jones Hogu created a print series based on Walker, she used that, right, and did lettering with that language. Other artists have sometimes renovated and revised and changed the gender of that original to make it more inclusive, less masculinist, right? And so the question I have for you all, when you're doing that digital work, what kind of emendations, what kind of context? How do you balance between the fidelity to the original text, right? And the reality of the need to kind of think about without condoning, without explaining away, but the context in which people evolve and write in ways that reflect things that maybe later when you're looking for in search of your mother's gardens, you're looking for your literary foremothers, they don't always do what you hope that they will do, right? Or speak the way you hope that, that you imagine they'll speak in the ways that they've already um, lived. Now, sandstones and limestone. Catlett only had a few sculptures using limestone early in her career, and I'm gonna get to one of the reasons why. Originally, when I prepared this talk, I had planned to begin with Elmina Castle because I've been doing research in Ghana now for, oh goodness, a decade and a half um, or more, and specifically thinking about gender and gendered performance in the walls, in the stone, like meeting with people at the University um, of Ghana who are archaeologists to think about, like and write about, right? That my uncle who passed, Uncle William Wilk, heard voices that told him to go to Ghana and he went and stayed for a spell. So I always say that I am a niece who is following the trail of my uncle who is a barber's clipped hair follicles, leading me to my ancestral homes. Um, and so instead of moving into the limestone dungeons of Elmina Castle, I wanted to move into the limestone sculptures, right, of Catlett. The Lost Archive, the Ghost Archive. I think I want to pause a minute and think about metaphor, right? This is Catlett's piece as a part of her thesis at the University of Iowa. Mother and child and it's lost. Lost. When I have the lost archive and the ghost archive, right, I want us to think about why this work is so important because as I was talking to P. Gabrielle Foreman um, yesterday evening, sometimes archivists will tell you something is lost but that just means they don't want to find it for the likes of you. <laughs> I'm not calling anybody out, I'm just speaking truths. Can I do that here? Can I, can I speak some truths? And so the reason I say this is, thinking about the metaphor of enslavement, thinking about the loss, the rupture, right? That this sculpture is the one that is lost um, to history is something that I really think we need to meditate with. Hi, Clarence. We go way back. Thanks for coming. Um, so I sat up to do a poem and thinking about the injustice of that losing. And so this is a lith lithograph by Catlett titled The Door of Justice, um, created in, um, and the print was done in 2000, and the title of the poem is When. So give me a second, and I will begin. doesn't like that. I actually pressed the wrong button to reset my passcode, so I have to open a different document for the poem. Okay. Okay, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. All right, here we go.
poem begins with an epigraph, and the epigraph is by Sadia Hartman. Even a word as anemic as justice isn't forthcoming in her thoughts. When she is finally ours, this justice, this juicy and accurate thing, when she belongs to copper hours and hours, drawing her dream, sketching this terrific, this horrific thing, needful to humans as art, fertile as soil, blooming to stone, shaped by her cupped hands. When she is finally seen being in bronze light, beating a song through terracotta coils, knitting with love's thick yarn, all migrants, all citizens in freedom's woven fabric. When she lends Lionel cut truths, when she sculpts magic from marble, then her genius shall be remembered. Then this artist exalting ahead of a woman, a woman ahead, this teacher lifting every voice and sing and form, this august force visioning young Douglas in dashing detail, this pole Walter scaling the bar of an invisible man through hues of heighted light, this chiseler carving hewers of wood and drawers of water hewing heart with sacred heart this painter painting a woman in every color tall as a cypress ancient as basswood linden and some beings blending violet blue binaries this mother enshrining the black madonna all mothers, all children, and molds form from Lovecraft, not lost, not lost, hurling black girls' hair in a wondrous halo. This Alice blooming in the blaze de Mexico. Oh, thank you. So, this is the African-American, well, I asked you about this one. Maybe I should have asked you guys. Anyone recognize what this one is? I, I jumped a gun. Okay, so not the Blackstonian, but we're in Charleston. This is an aerial view, right, of the new International African-American Museum. Um, and one of the reasons I'm bringing it up, my family um, grew up um, um, in Charleston, on my maternal uh, side of the family. And I thought about this particular image because of how orderly it looks, how much it resembles those boxes, you know, the, when I mentioned the linear feet, how the visual itself evokes the lie of the archive, right? The lie that all of these things are so carefully contained when really, right, slavery was messy, right? Now, if you don't know, now you should know. This is, and I said we need to see, I believe in digital, but somebody needs to hold it. about this is, what I would argue about what I'd like to see is more of than what I see um, Gabrielle Foreman doing, what I see um, Carmen Wong doing with your choreo poem at the Live Theater Alliance, is a kind of collaborative practice that's editorial, that's artwork, that's poetry, that includes forwards by Evie Shockley or Kwame Dawes, that's apperceptive alchemy changing not just the way we see, but the way we perceive how we see. That's what digitizing black women's archives will do for us, right? Not on conjecture, but with access to the material, right? Now, I know in just uh, shortly, we'll have the panel, and it says we're gonna have artists and scholars in this, but the beautiful thing about this book, Gabrielle has a poem in there, right? In the middle of all my relation, right? And so the beautiful thing about that is the way in which these kinds of spaces, which black women have been doing, just as you all just presented, right? Th th in terms of mixing emerging ground race, plays and essays and scholarship and poetry, right? M moving beyond boundaries. The thing about collaborative aesthetics, right? Is that not only does Glennis Redman, but others raise questions about black historical treasures that have been hidden and stolen. 
about black cultural legacies that are buried in those we resurrect. I'm gonna check on my time so I don't go over. And let me see, how am I on time? Where's the little, I'm good. Okay, just double checking. Okay, all right, great. So this is you all. This is my shout out to your work, collage of letters and papers on your website, but it's a safe collaborative aesthetic. So often digital work, particularly when it's done by women and particularly when it's done by black women, becomes seen not as a labor of creative genius, but a labor of accumulative genius. I have looked at your work. It is beautiful work. And it needs to be acknowledged in that way. Even the decisions, even the flyer for this event, even the beautiful things out there for the reception, right? So I wanna move from discussing digital preservation and increasing access, which is the goal on digitizing Black record, record, Records Day, Black Women's Records Day, to restricted access, to recurring memories, to make a case Thinking of the former two-term poet laureate, Natasha Trethewey, Pulitzer Prize winner. She's, I think every one of the books she's published has had some um, award and um, engagement as such, in part because what was pricking me, and you know, the punctum when Bart talks about the thing that punches you and cuts you and pricks you in a photograph, I was pricked by that word record. Black women have a oblique to say the least, relationship to records. And Damaris Hill's book, A Bound Woman and Is a Dangerous Thing, engages a scholarship by Dr. Collie Gross that intersects on how we appear in the record of criminality, right? And the record of mental unwellness being criminalized, in the record, right, of sexual fluidity being criminalized, in the record. So this is Memorial Drive, a picture of what she notes as a, a daughter's memoir. Trethewey has spent a lot of time in her work thinking about older photographs, right? From the periods that you all are focusing on, from the early 1900s, from the, the 1940s. My, grand, my grandmother took and washed, right? That was the expression that got used. Um, she also was a teacher. And Trethewey Way's first book, Domestic Work, right, thinks about like black women in the South who took and wash, right? Um, why am I saying that? For all her study of photographs, you all see there, what you see there right there on the right sand of that slide? Somebody tell me what you see. What's that, what's that say to you? No cameras, right? For someone who's so in invested in thinking about archival photographs, right? I had to be really nice to the archivist and say, can I please just take a picture of the box, right? I wasn't violating any archival rules. I'm not trying to get anybody um, 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 <laughs> about out for what was restricted. And why did that matter, right? It's called the Rose Library, right? I wanna walk us through something because there's a loop about going to Trethewey's archives specifically. And this is from her memoir. You can try to forget. You can go a long time without making a full revolution, but memory is a loop. While you all are digitizing records, the beauty of digitizing the spatialization, the coordinate maps that you're doing, and I'm gonna show one in just a second, helps us deal with trauma, like Trethaway, I am not going to you know, I'm not gonna repeat because it's a very well known part of her experience, um, but it doesn't define her or experience, am I clear? And it's gonna come up in another slide I'll show. So you can see here, there's Atlanta, right? Emory's down there, Buckhead, and over to the right, you see that stone? I started out with limestone and Elmina stone because I knew I had to get to Stone Mountain because she gets to Stone Mountain in her writing, right? The monument to the Confederacy. If we do not create, if we do not digitize, if we do not support, if we don't get allies who believe in supporting, right, 
our memorials to the value of our life, our memorials to everybody having equal access, right, to not just monumental memories, there will always be people who want to memorialize hate and give it spiritual, soulful language. Look at that, the pilgrimage, carved in eternal granite. Sounds really kind of religious, doesn't it? Except it's a memorial to the Confederacy. This is my driving question. How then can we, as black women, move to digitize our records without distancing ourselves from our history and our herstory from the communal, right? The human, the ecological, the eco-political, the answer. Somebody else read it for me. It's okay if it's not on the screen. The answer, I put in a cap. Someone read it for me. Okay, thank you. You acknowledge digi digital records are not solely a destination, but a soul drive. Right, a soul drive. Don't let the digital hard drive hearten your soul. Doing archival work, I, I've done it in earlier periods, can be traumatic, right? I didn't use examples from my home university because I was in there looking at Confederate letters from former UNC students, and it was a bit traumatizing, right? Like, I was like, you got to gird yourself up when you read letters from UNC students celebrating the fact that they have destroyed and decimated and made prisoners of runaways, their term, not mine, self-emancipated people, who in their precarity have set up a cam right on the outskirts of campus, right? Say things like, it was exciting, Cousin Leo. So this is an excerpt from Audible. If you all can play the sound, it's only 30 seconds. Let me see if it will. Yeah, let's see. If not, I'll just describe it in the interest of time. There it goes. Oops. Did you get it? Yeah, I do, but I'm, when I clicked before, it didn't do it. No, it's going to keep going. All right, I'll just say that the opening is Natasha Trethewey narrating, saying who she's dedicated to, her mom, her grandma, right, her aunt. And why that matters is that she narrates it, right? It's her voice. And if you listen, as I have <laughs> multiple times, to the entire memoir, the pace and cadence for and how she actually reads those names is different. It's a little slower, right? I mean, she's a professional at what she does than as she continues. And so while you're doing this digitization, even though in some of the earlier periods, you might not have full sonic curation, there are ways we can get to sounds. We were talking about some of this last night, right? Without replicating the travesty that it has done to misrepresenting our speech, right? So, I have no flower seeds. This is my answer to the question. It comes from Dr. Shirley Moody Turner, right? Um, the portable, Anna Julia Cooper. So here, right, biography of Hannah, her mom, right, who was enslaved by the Haywood family in Marley. Another version. This comes from, say as a thank you to you all, Digital Howard. I went on there because part of what happens is that collaborative aesthetics only work if there's mutual perspect, partnership, and true attribution, right? That was done with this project. I've been looking at it and checking it out. Collaborative aesthetics works if the trope of the shadow archive or the cemetery or paying respect is a form of mutuality and respect. I went to the cemetery, y'all. I went to ask Anna Julia Cooper's permission to talk about her today. To, I went to the cemetery to be present so I wasn't only present with her words. I'm a bibliophile, right? All of us are, else we wouldn't be in these universities or many of us are in our own ways. And I brought an offering. I took, because I couldn't actually read her handwriting that well, so thank you, Dr. Tur Moody Turner. I read this poem and you all can see it. She said, don't bring me no what? Excuse me, I do speak the king's and queen's English, but I also speak real English, too. No violets, no wild honeysuckle, which used to grow in my grandmom's um, yard. She says instead, right, in the full version of her poem, she says, remember me for one of those three terms I had at the beginning of my slides, education. 
She ends by saying, I know you know this, just say a teacher is on vacation now. Right? So I brought eucalyptus for the scent and because I came to appreciate, to be desire to do more about Anna Julia Cooper when I was at Stanford as a graduate student, and I would sit outside and be like, Lord, some part of this is really hard, but the eucalyptus is calming and I'm going for you know? So even earlier periods, contrary to the idea that some people, that we just go back to the Black Arts Movement, can motivate you to be a contemporary activist in your own way. That I was going to get to, right? My case for you, my proposition, right? If we're thinking about the cemetery as a repository, as an archive, which I would argue that it is, right? When we're itemizing, right, these repositories, we have a geomac with those repositories, right? The city cemetery in Raleigh, as well as the archives at Haunt. Is it just me? Or do these, these gates look a little bit alike to y'all? Hmm? You see it, right? It's not just me. The one on the left is called historic. And I think any cemetery that has Hanley, Hannah Staley, hey good, Anna Julia Cooper's mama in it is historic, right? The Mount Hope Cemetery. Any cemetery that houses the remains, not the soul, but the remains, right? A place of respect and honor of Anna Julia Cooper is historic, right? They don't say on the website, but when you come up there, you know that it is a huge cemetery that honors the Confederacy, right? And why does that matter? Is this an entrance or barrier to repository? Now, on the right, that's not a cemetery. That's the entrance that I drive to to go research in Emory University's archives in the actual files, not the digital files. So another case sometimes for digitization is not just financial. I got two minutes. I thank you. I'll be done in two. It's not just digitization solely for access, but digitization because sometimes you're not ready to walk through the Haywood Hopkins entrance, a beautiful gate that is a memorial, right, to one of Emory's early presidents who was a slave owner and supporter of slavery, right? It's a beautiful gate. Even that photo, it's an early photo, right? Talking about these good and great men, right? I edited out the other part of what's on the digital archive where it says, well, you know, although he was a staunch supporter of slavery, after the Civil War ended, he rejected it and gave a sermon that just moved the hearts of donors and benefactors who donated up to $175,000 to get Emory out of debt to raise its endowment. I'm, I'm saying that to say that if we don't put these digital truths in conversation with our digital truths, right? Then that becomes the er narrative, right? Benevolent, and I, I don't, you know, I don't know Atticus Green Haywood good. I don't have anything against him personally. I just have a hard time believing a stark supporter of slavery in four years, right at the end of the Civil War, had that much change of heart, and it just so happened to get money for Emory. I mean, that might be true for him. I'm not, I don't really know. I'm saying that the context needs to be, be given. So I'm going to move to my end since I have my two minutes. This is a question for each of you, right? Your archive doesn't have to be, we were talking about this last night at dinner, in a university place. It doesn't even always have to be online. It can be in your own family. Sometimes they won't answer. And you don't have to be a black woman. Don't let me get in trouble for saying that. But every one of us has a personal relationship to learning something that we think we know about our kin and kind, right? That makes us more human, that makes us more committed to justice, that makes us more committed to education, that makes us more committed to empathy. The last thing of empathy is Archive of feeling. This is a this is one of the sex workers in New Orleans in 1910 that Natasha Trethaway writes about. And I specifically wanted to show you all that because I wanted to find something in the time period that you all were covering for today's talk. So I emailed um, her the first time I went to her archive when it first opened, and 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 back then she was gracious enough after some correspondence to grant me um, an interview. And then I sent her, and this is matters in terms of thinking about black feminist digital what works. I sent her a copy of the draft of an essay that was a part of um, a chapter 
and asked if she would look at it, not as a scholar for her permission to approve it in the sense of say what I'm saying about your work is okay or not, but as someone saying, did I miss something? Did I get it right? Can I tell you that the level of respect I have for her as a writer, as a woman, as a person, that she wrote back and said, oh, your essay, it's really beautiful, because I was trying to honor her mom outside of the kind of context where she's often written about or talked about. This is years before her, her memoir came out. I had put a typo in the Poet Laureate of the United States poem in my essay and added lines. It didn't catch that. And she graciously said, I hope you can, I, it's a great essay, but I did notice a couple of typos when you misquoted my poetry. I hope it will get corrected before, you know I made sure it got corrected, right? But that's an ethic of care, right? No one was gonna read my essay and think, oh, there was a, something wrong with Natasha Trethewey's poetry. She did me a solid out of respect, right? That's a born digital archive, right? It's not a handwritten letter I sent her. I share it with you, I wouldn't visually show it because one of the things about restriction, I'm respecting her privacy. She didn't have to do that for me, right? And, um, and I know it wasn't vanity because when I sent her the essay once it's out to show the correction, she didn't reply. Like, she's like, she, like it was really not about that, right? So I'm gonna end there. There was a audio, I won't have time to play, but I wanna thank you. And I hope that our time together illuminates connections in our contemporary and our historical archives. And I will rush to my thank you slide, which is at the end. I always, I had about five more slides. I knew it would take too long to say all your names, but I said them last night when I said my prayers. I say it in my mind when you all getting up here making sure my stuff is set up. And um, I tried to get everybody in there. If I miss anybody, Charge my head and my brain, not my heart. And thank you. We are going to move to the Q&A portion. I was just about to ask you, please, we can't do a Q&A without you. So what's going to happen is we're going to We'll, we'll let her gather her belongings. Uh, and we'll move center stage, um, but we'll take about the next 10 minutes. Um, if you have any questions, we will have a mic. Can we have someone from the BWOA team set up a mic in the aisle? And you can feel free to walk to the mic if you want to ask a question out loud. Otherwise, you can raise your hand, and we do have wireless mics so we can come to you. But if something moved you, if something spoke to your spirit, or if you are just curious about something you heard today, please feel free to offer your question into this space. But before we do so, I do want to open up our discussion, Dr. Mib Jones. So I will join you right there in the center. Thank you. No, thank so you. Good to have this conversation. Thank you. Can we give her another round of applause, please? Thank you so, so, so much. Thank you. So I do have a few questions that I have prepared for you, but ultimately, after listening to this presentation, I think some of the questions might change, okay. right? No because we spoke about some of the things that you will talk about, but it, it's, it's something different when you get to witness the photos, when you actually sit in this space and you hear the ways in which you interpret it from the poetry to the ways that you made sure you enlivened us with art, okay? So I actually want to start out with a question about healing. Mm -hmm. I want us to think about the ways in which we can constitute the archive as a place of healing and repair, and how we can keep in mind the kinds of violences that are represented in these archival spaces with the ways that black women are represented, underrepresented, or erased, right? So as we keep all that in mind, my question for you is how do we approach the archive as a space of healing and repair? All right, um, that's such a beautiful and powerful question, and I'll, since I've already spoken, I'll try to be succinct. Number one, when I sent that email to Natasha Trethaway that I alluded to, I did two interviews with her when I was doing my research, and I didn't record them. 
Like I told her I wanted to actually really, I did not want Trethaway, the persona poet that knows she's gonna be recorded for an interview. I didn't want to interest, instrumentalize it for some other thing. I really wanted to understand her work, not make the assumption, I'll give an example. Part of healing sometimes is not assuming forms of intimacy with black women. It's not about just don't touch my hair. Don't assume you know my heart. We experience that sometimes in the archive as black women. And when I interviewed her, the first time at the second time, I said, I find you really inscrutable. And she said, thank you so much for saying that. Because she understood, I, she got the energy of respect and boundary that I was giving her, right? Like I was, because she writes a lot about particularly very painful experiences that she's had. And then people layer onto that, even going in her archive, there were examples I chose not to use in my slides that were really great examples about the power of digitization. Born to, I had an intellectual part of what I was going to do, but I chose instead, and I'll give an example that you said, racialization. To read how she self-identified racially gendered early in her career, but then to read in the archive how others were racializing her, right? Um, um, was was difficult, right? Especially in the context of conflating the thing we tell undergraduates: don't assume that the work is the same thing as the person, right? It's a work. I mean, she's. That doesn't mean there's not a correction, but it's not it's not completely mimetic, right? She's not U.S. poet laureate because she had some traumatically experiences in her life. It's because she crafted and worked, did soul work, but also literary work. And so I did research on her mother and wrote about healing circles. So the digital design of this, I have a thank you to Jasmine Powell, who is really great with tech. So we worked on it together because I wanted the aesthetics of my presentation and digital design to actually reflect. I talked to her about healing circles. So that essay I mentioned that's a part of a larger chapter on her work, I talked about the way that she uses form as a form of like recurrent healing circles. But in the memoir, she doesn't, it's a loop. That's why some of those designs are circles and some look like a trap loop. Because if you've read the memoir, she had a very traumatic experience of being in a loop and being tormented in a loop on the highway. So I was using the map to show that, right? And using design to show that, but also trying to resist that. I also think you can do work yourself. There's the digital stuff, but then you can write. I write letters when I'm in the archives. I do creative healing rituals when I'm in archives. I make sure when I'm doing archives that have to do not only with enslaved African-American woman, but I, I haven't gotten there yet, but I actually know who, where the cemetery is um, of my great-great-grandfather that enslaved um, and had children with my great-great-grandmother. And that cemetery is in South Carolina. And so I, that, I was trying to make it, um, uh, Shirley, I was trying to make it to Fabius J. Haywoods as a step, because I don't have that traumatic immediate relationship with, and I was like, maybe I can intellectualize this and get there, right? But I think that you have to trust yourself and know yourself when you're ready to do the, and I'm not trying to be, for people who are atheists, I respect that, but I mean spirit. When I say soul, I'm not trying to be, you know, religiously only doctrinal. You have to do the kind of work that helps you make sure you're girded up when you're reading. And I mean, I went to slavery, but let's be real. What I loved about and hated, <laughs> hate's a too strong word, but hurt, what hurt me about the article that you did about Anna Julia Cooper. I grew up in DC. I knew about M Street. I did a number of things. If you grew up in DC, you were Howard at Dunbar. I had no idea until reading your Washington Post article that the police showed up in front of one of the most elite schools <laughs> in the nation at that time. Poised, this is your work, not me, so I'm not trying to speak for you, I just wanna poise to arrest her if she entered in, in the moment they told her that they weren't reappointing her, I've got it right, right, because she was trying to teach right and well, not because she was failing, 
And so that sense of the carceral, right? Like that's, I thought of using that memo, um, Memorial Drive, uh, Trethaway includes a record that was released to her 25 years later, actually by a police officer who had empathy, right? Which is why it's really important to not, you know, I have a lot of critiques of the carceral state and the complex. I would be 100%, I'm not standing here as an apology for what it's, it's done <laughs> to indigenous and black and Latinx and queer and trans folk and women. But that doesn't mean you, it, you can be blind to the humanity of people. And that person knew the records were being purged. I don't want to give the memoir away and gave it and gave it to her and she used it in her memoir. Yes, thank you so, so much for that elaborate answer. I do want to, no, I, I mean that. No, 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 I mean that in terms of, I saw people nodding. I know I was certainly moved by that answer because I think that what we have to acknowledge is that for a lot of us, this work is personal, right? So I do want to make space in case anyone, you know, walks up to that mic and have a question, but my, my follow-up question deals with thinking about the personalization of that process, right? Of um, you began your presentation talking to us about entrances, right? And so for those of us who are sitting in this room or tuned in virtually and thinking about how it is they may begin to approach the archive, how they may enter in to archival research, right? What are What is some advice that you would uh, maybe suggest, right? Because you end your presentation with us thinking about our own personal archive, right? So how do we make space when we think about these academic repositories versus when we think about the archives that lay the foundation of our home, right? When we think about how we even use the arts to preserve, right? What we're thinking about also is the ways in which poems become an archive, right? And poets become archivists. So I know for me, that's an elaborate question, right? But again, the sake of time, I wanted to make sure that we didn't leave this space. If there's anyone here, you know, a lot of us in BWOA are currently doing this work, but I'm sure there are a few people who are out there listening who was just so moved by everything you said, and they are trying to figure out how they might enter into this kind of work that we are doing here. Always 
brilliant. I mean, and you all are brilliant. But I know that Dr. Foreman, I know that Dr. Turner, you all are making it out of the wazoo. <laughs> like, I'm very impressed with you all. And not just mm -hmm. you, but, but not everyone has your intellect, your, your, your skill sets, your access to mentors. That doesn't have to be the only way you get access to our help, right? Mm -hmm. So ask for help so that you can follow judge. And follow things like, especially with black women and black people, it's an interesting, black cemeteries across the country mm -hmm. are being overdeveloped, raised, so we need this material to get access to. It's not by accident. In terms of gentrification in certain areas, right? Find out where, you know, neighborhood home associations are, or civic associations in areas of people that you might, you know, follow your intuition and also follow. Yeah, I know. Right after. Dr. Taylor, a poet of our <laughs> mission. Thank you for coming. Great. Okay, I, I know that they want to cut us real quick, real quick, but I, I would be remiss not to ask you um, the title of your presentation and throughout the duration of your presentation, you use the word drive a lot, right? And you talk to us a little bit about metaphors, right? And, and, and having to interpret the archives uh, uh, in many different ways. So I just want to take a quick second, if you could, in one sentence, two sentences, maybe talk to us about this idea of drive, right? Because you also, yes, you're counting the amount of times you use it, because I was trying to keep track too. She talks about um, the driving question. You also talk about soul drive. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes. So, drive. Flash drive, the ephemeral. Hard drive, the, the, the external, but also early on had the spinning disc, right? So, motion and stasis, right? Mm -hmm. Motivation, urges and feelings. It matters to think about doing work on Trethaway and noticing and teaching the number of undergraduate first year um, <laughs> young boys mm -hmm. who, men, not boys, excuse me, the young men, couple who always wanted to be like, oh, I'm gonna go do research on Storyville and this, was very illuminating to me. Like maybe I was naive, but I just didn't, I, I had so intellectualized Bella Sophia's mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. I blinded myself to drives or mm -hmm. urges that some people go to archives with cur curious, mm -hmm. right? And I'm not dealing politics and respectability here. I just mean, I was trying to get at that, that we can see it in the archives. That, that unfortunately the violence is visited upon them, but the thistle papers, like you will see or read some stuff. So protect yourself if you do that. Drive, seek funding if you can, or collaborate or network, because physically, if all the work isn't yet digitized, right, it costs money and time to go across the country mm -hmm. to different, or internationally to different archives. And I would be remiss if I wasn't honest about that. I feel like sometimes we'll see books or articles and be like, wow! But if you look very closely at acknowledgments or at footnotes, if they're doing it right, they acknowledge mm -hmm. that. Does that answer? I tried to keep it short, y'all. Is that great? Thank you so much for your intentionality. Can we give her a round of applause again? So we are about to go to break, um, and then we will meet everyone back here in about 10 minutes, okay?
She is an award-winning actress and highly sought after for her original plays, particularly her one-woman play, Voices of F.E.W., which chronicles the life of Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Famed abolitionist, literary figure, and champion of civil and women's rights. She's a contemporary champion for civil engagement. Sharia has worked tirelessly to birth and grow the Sankofa African American Theater Company of Harrisburg and amplify black voices, artists, and stories authentically and honorably on stage. And Sharia lives in Harrisburg area with her husband, William Ben, and two children and three grandchildren. Our next panelist is Janelle Moore. Janelle is a middle and high school study, social studies teacher at George Washington Carver High School of Engineering and Science. She received her undergraduate degree in Afro-American Studies from Harvard University, a master's degree in education, and a certificate in project-based learning from the University of Pennsylvania. She is pursuing a doctorate in educational policy and leadership with a focus on diversity and equity in the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She was the 2018 recipient of the Lynn Back Award for Distinguished Teaching in the Philadelphia School District. Janelle, um, I mean, yes, Janelle um, Moore Allman has served as a curriculum writer and reviewer for the Color Conventions Project since 2020 and is currently a 2023-2024 JT Mellon Satellite Partner with the Center for Black Digital Research. And finally, but definitely not least, we have Janelle Morris. I'm, I'm sorry, Jennifer Morris. Jennifer Morris is an archivist at the Smithsonian Anacostia Community Museum, the first federally funded neighborhood museum located in Washington, D.C. She primarily oversees archival processing, cataloging, and reference services. Her interests are in care and preservation of family records, photographs, and cultural heritage archives, with doc which document the com community-based activities and individuals of individuals and groups. She earned her BA in anthropology from the University of Maryland, College Park, and a MLIS from the University of Pittsburgh. She received further archival training from George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film and Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. Jennifer is a member of several professional associations, including the Society of American Archivists and the Afro-American Genealogical and Historical Society. So welcome our panelists. Thank you, Kesla. So um, we will start with Jennifer Morris um, and we'll go to each panelist, so Jennifer will go first and then followed by um, Janelle Moore Almond and then Sharia Ben, and then we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers. It's a pleasure to be with you all here this afternoon to talk about working with black women's archival records at the Smithsonian's Anacostia Community Museum. For those who don't know anything about the Anacostia Community Museum, we were founded as an outpost of the Smithsonian Institution to engage the local African American community that was not visiting the museums on the National Mall. Our founding director, John Kennard, worked closely with community advisory groups to transform the original purpose of the museum as an experimental storefront museum to a community museum focusing broadly on African American history and culture. The museum soon gained national recognition for its participatory approach to museum research, exhibitions, and programming. Community-based projects supported local artists, highlighted social issues impacting the community, elevated neighborhood history, and resulted in the development of a unique museum collection where the perspectives of women and other underrepresented groups um, were sought for documentation and preservation. In 2022, the Smithsonian's Anacostia Museum received an internal grant to catalog and digitize approximately 390 audio recordings of interviews of Washington, D.C. women in its holdings. The goal of the project was to increase the discovery and online accessibility of women of color 
by one, creating public facing item level catalog records of each recording, and two, create agent records. And that's within our database are names of people and um, events that, uh, that are associated with the recording. And three, create high quality digital surrogates and ingest those into our digital access management system. The 390 interviews form part of four distinct collections from the community-based work conducted between 1970 and 1990 by three remarkable women of the music, uh, excuse me, women of the museum staff. Louise Daniel Hutchison here, Gail S. Lowe, and Portia James. And it's important to include these women because they're really responsible for diversifying uh, in the early years the Smithsonian's holdings as it relates to women and African American women. Okay, so um, let's talk, I want to talk about the workflow for digitizing these collections. So we targeted those 390 um, cassette tapes, basically. We hired a, uh, contractors to do inventories and describe the actual assets, send it to a vendor, and then after post-digitization, uh, ingested those materials into our dams. Archivist listened to all digitized recordings and created full descriptive recordings in the collections um, management um, system, which we use as A-Space. And we were um, discussing with the archivist what to include within those descriptors. We wanted in the scope and content notes, we wanted to know what organizations those women were associated with, their educational background, and um, any type of civic organizations as well. So we wanted to really, um, really get a, a comprehensive narrative of their, of their lives the, and their achievements. Okay, so I got about five minutes, so I'm gonna rush through this. Here is one of uh, the subjects of the interviews, Othea settled Egypt here. And here's uh, a copy of her actual catalog record and her scope and content, but also what's important is actually the access points that we use to make the collections more discoverable. And a lot of times, of course, these women, everyday women, are not in like Library of Congress authority databases. So we actually created some of these uh, names and locations and organizations. What resulted? We had a, to expand the access and increase the, increase the engagement with this rich oral history. We created this site, excuse me which is Washington DC Women in Conversation. And this, and as you can see here, we did a photo of the woman if there was one available, but also a bio of the woman, but quotes from the interviews and also excerpts from the actual recordings and that you can actually go and listen to. And they're also categorized by topics. And so you just click on the link and then you will hear uh, and see what they talked about. And how am I doing on time? Two minutes, okay. Uh, I just want to talk a real quick about, we do have materials related to um, 19th and early 20th century women in our collection. Most notable is Mary Church Terrell interview that she did in the 1950s with Americans All radio station. It was a local radio station that aired between 1940s and 1960s. And it really focused on segregation and um, discrimination within the nation's capital and also national. And this is really remarkable that we have this collection because it was done in 1950s and we had issues with delamination of the actual recording. And so we had to send these off, get them cleaned, and digitized. 
When we first got it done, it was maybe, we thought it was about five, maybe five minutes that we were able to save, but we're able to save more, and we're still going through those recordings now. And we have uh, seven discs uh, from that uh, episode that she was on. Excuse me. Also, another collection is um, Louise Daniel Hutchinson and her work with Anna J. Cooper. We still have, even though materials have been digitized, we still have researchers who come and they want to see those collections because of all that Louise um, did as far as her research. She spent four years, as you can see, four years working on this, so she did a lot of, of copying, correspondence, and communication with um, family members, um, documentation, so that's still in the archives, and we still have researchers who um, consult the collection. And we're going to actually digitize this. This is her diploma, and it was actually found in a store in D.C., and this is the owner of the store at the time. That was in 1982, and so you never know where you can find archives. Uh, records related to women. And so he donated to us in 1982. Lastly, a um, future digitalization project that we're working on is Javina Towns Turner Papers. She was the first wife of Lorenzo Dow Turner, known as the father of Gullah Studies. And she really helped him in the formative years of his research, but she doesn't really get a lot of credit. And so we are going to um, digitize her, her work, her papers, will be the next project that we will work on. Thank you. <laughs> and now we'll hear from Janelle Moore Almond, who will talk a little bit about her work. Thank you so much, um, and also thank you for the invite. I'm always excited to talk about teaching. I'm always excited to talk about the color conventions as well. Um, for those of you who don't know, and actually I'm, I'm a teacher, so I'm gonna treat you like one. How many of you have heard of the colored conventions? Everybody in this room, you are an anomaly. <laughs> because when I go out into the world, when I talk about this project anywhere else, and I mentioned the color conventions, most people are like, no, I've never heard of that. I don't know what you're talking about. When did that happen? Um, and the color conventions occurred from 1830 until after the Civil War, where African Americans gathered across the United States, as well as Canada, to participate in political meetings held at the state and the national levels. This was the cornerstone of organizing in the 19th century. And it brought black men and women together in this decades-long campaign for civil rights. Now, when we talk about civil rights, we usually only hear about them as an offshoot of the 1950s and 1960s movements. However, the color conventions actually got their start after the racial violence that was occurring against uh, African Americans in Cincinnati, Ohio. These are race riots, by the way, and I don't think we teach enough about the fact that in major cities, in urban areas, um, systemic violence was visited upon African Americans. And what's interesting about the call for the color conventions is that this call was made by a 16-year-old. 16 is the age of the students that I teach, in most part. So you have this young person that is calling for change. You have this young person that is looking at what their life is like. And that call was taken up not only by the community, but the, the nation, by other black people to say, no, we have to have an organized response if we are going to secure our rights and our livelihoods. So in Philadelphia, hey, um, the Richard, the, Bishop Richard Allen answered the call, and he, among other people, of course, convenes the first colored convention in September of 1830. Um, as a Philadelphian, and as a black person, again, this history is so important. But as a Philadelphian, um, I was in a classroom last week with my eighth graders, and 
Um, I'm teaching them about the yellow fever epidemic. I asked them how many of them had heard of Richard Allen, and no one had. And we are failing our students. It is not intentional, but it is definitely structural. So when I think about why I teach the color conventions, why I include these interactions with these digital resources, it's because one, they need to know that civil rights organizing, humanity organizing, didn't start with Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. It didn't start there, even though that's what they learned. Um, and that for us to be black in this space means that we are consistently asking questions, not only of ourselves, but of our government, of our society, about what it means to be an American, what it means to have rights, what it means to be a citizen in a place that says that all men were created equal and yet has this bloody history of making sure that we are not. We also have to acknowledge that many of our students don't know enough about the history of their people. When we talk about cultural literacy, when we talk about culturally responsive pedagogy, it also has to include a model that speaks to resistance. A lot of times when we talk about, oh, well, we're gonna include things that are culturally re relevant, we only wanna include things that are traumatic. We only wanna talk about the things that have caused people pain. I also want to teach my students about the ways in which we resisted, we organized, we overcome so that it becomes a model for the things that students are doing today. And then again, like I mentioned before, we need to start making more connections, not only in Philadelphia, but across the country to the local history that exists um, about African-Americans organizing. The other thing I wanna talk about is the hidden curriculum. So the hidden curriculum is not the curriculum that teachers might receive. It's the curriculum that each of us learns by virtue of existing in spaces. The hidden curriculum says that again, when you learn about African-American history, it starts with Phyllis Wheatley, and then we disappear outside of being enslaved until about the 1950s. And then we marched, sort of, and then everything got better once schools were desegregated. The hidden curriculum also says that when it comes to identities and people who get to be activists as well as leaders, if you are a black woman, your job is to make sandwiches and support. And when we think about these hidden curriculum, we think about the messages that we send our students over and over and sometimes ourselves replicate this is why it becomes even more important for us to look at the actual primary sources that are included in these digitized records. It gives us a lens to look at our students as curriculum and these communities as curriculum and not just the things that we are provided with textbooks. It also, again, revises this narrative to include the experiences and the voices of black women, which we know are crucial to every movement that has ever occurred in this country. So some of the exhibits that we explore with our students, um, again, we have the color conventions and the carceral states. Um, we talk specifically about women and the Ohio movement. Um, Marianne Shedd carries her story in the color conventions and her impact. Um, another one that we talk specifically about women's rights and we use with students is advancing black women's rights in, term, in the 1850s in terms of higher education. Another thing that we have done is we've developed units, if anybody wants them, please see me, I can give them to you, they're free, um, for the School District of Philadelphia. These are open units. Um, they are completely, again, without cost. They've been taught in multiple classrooms. Um, in unit one, we look at the color conventions overall. I've taught this unit. Our students had their own color conventions. And yes, our convention president was a young black woman. Um, in unit two, we talk about um, black women's economic power. So students look at the ways in which women, particularly business owners in Philadelphia, contributed to the success of the color conventions. 
Um, we also have created teaching guides. So for exhibits that don't have specific curriculums or units developed, teachers can go in and they can find resources, methods, questions, standards that they can apply in their classrooms that are done. It'll give them a direction to how to use the exhibits um, in their specific classrooms because as teachers know, if your resources are tight, we will use them all the time. Um, one of the other things that we are doing is we are partnering with community. So this is a mural um, that was developed with the education team um, and some community organizers in Philadelphia. This actually exists. So Dr. Foreman, Denise Berger, who's not here, Brandy Hay, or hey, um, in partnership with Mural Arts in Philadelphia, um, they created Mural Days. They worked with uh, the community activists in this neighborhood to create this mural that includes, again, figures from the original color conventions, but also modern activists from today. So they are creating primary sources. So the women, just as a side note, the women that we focus on from the original housing project to the new one that exists today, you can see the mural on the side. Um, these women um, are responsible for the changes in this neighborhood and they are the primary sources. They are the sources that are now being digitized. We are pulling in again, um, community and people as curriculum for the education. So in terms of pedagogy, and I'm just gonna wrap this up, um, our students aren't getting the historical thinking skills in classrooms that they need. This allows that to happen. Um, it's also, again, culturally relevant teaching, culturally relevant pedagogy. Um, it increases the level of rigor, but also provides them access. So many of our students don't know what an archive is, friends. They have not been to libraries. They do not have library cards. So when you say to them, archives are for everyone, each of you is walking around with an archive in your phone. What this helps us do in our classroom is provide access so that they can do the high level academic work we know that they're capable of, but they have entrance to it. So I have some more examples of student work. Again, I will sort of go through because I don't want to take up everybody else's time. But very quickly, uh, one of the assignments was to create a tree of leadership. This one is based on Rachel Cliff, one of the few member women that is actually identified in colored convention um, minutes. And they use the metaphor of a tree to talk about leadership um, in terms of our students talking about the colored conventions after they've looked at the primary sources. I'm just going to end with what one of my students said. Um, African Americans saw a need for the color conventions because their resources were limited and a space for black people to communicate their needs to each other was needed to create a foundation for their lives. Discrimination was present in the 1830s and has evolved itself into different forms of presentations. I believe that creating community should be the biggest form of activism because community creates change. Cre working with these archives allows us to continue to create this community. So I'm gonna wrap up there. Thank you again so much. Thank you so much, Janelle. And it's really nice to be in community today. And I'd like to now invite um, Sharia Ben to talk a little bit about her work as well. The attempt to silence me, make me accept an unacceptable state of invisibility and diminished value started from the time that I was born. Nay, it started from the time I was conceived. Mulatto. What I fully understood was that he, my father, was gone long before I was born, before the shame of me could take hold. My mother was dead before I was three, before she could redeem me from the shame of being me. Resistance? sparks change or war. 
my dear friend John Brown was hanged for his failed attempts of liberation at Harper's Ferry. When he arrived in Philadelphia, I was there with his wife, Mary, as she went through his clothing. She dug deep into his inside pocket vest and found my letter. John Brown went to his death with my words next to his heart. I feel that I am somewhat of a novice here in this space, upon this platform, born of a race whose inheritance has been outrage and wrong. Most of my life has been spent battling those wrongs. We are all bound up together in one great bundle of humanity, and society cannot trample on its feeblest member without receiving the curse in its soul. You tried that in the case of the Negro. I do not believe giving women the ballot is going to immediately cure all the ills of our society. I do not believe that white women are dewdrops exhaled from the skies. You white women speak here of rights. I speak of wrongs. Make me a grave wherever you will, on a lonely plain or on top of a hill. Make it among earth's humblest of graves, but not in a land where men are slaves. I ask no monument high or proud to arrest the gaze of passers-by. All that my yearning soul craves is bury me not in the land of slaves. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Are we? Hmm. All of those words and segments that I just shared with you came because I was able to access archives. And I found so much of the essence of Francis Ellen Watkins Harper. The truth is, she found me. And I felt compelled to tell her story. It was 15 years ago when I first came across that powerful human being. And I thought, how did I go through life and never hear this woman's name? Well, she wasn't a priority. She was part of the systemic erasure of strong black women who made us and gave us what we have in this society. The access to archives helped me become a creative, a storyteller, a playwright. I'm a curious being, and in the still quiet of the night, I found joy in archives. In the still of the night, I have children, I have husband, I have a life, I have a job, I have all of this, and I do my best work in the middle of the night. And I am thankful that I was able to indulge my curiosity in finding and knitting together the scattered pieces, the scattered stories, the scattered soul of Francis Ellen Watkins Harper and so many others. Disembodied stories, 
sitting in boxes, in buildings, in archives, in books that I had access to. I found these pieces, but this access wasn't easy. Just because something is available, I found out many times that I did not have the password, I did not have the membership, and I couldn't get the information. But I knew it was out there. So when we talk about uh, and, and, and explore digitizing these records, access is very important to the lay people because powerful things can be done with the information. In those digital records, I found life. I was able to move Francis and the buried stories of people under this state's capital and the Old Eighth Ward, a vibrant community where there were black homeowners and business owners and teachers and preachers and abolitionists and activists, their stories covered, buried, but knowledge that there was a digital archive. I was able to move from just writing papers or knowing this, so information from surviving to stories that thrive, moving from a collection to a connection to a collective that I could share through the form of theater with actors and dramaturgy and sharing and creating lesson guides and study guides. Now they have access. And then also with the community that was disconnected. We have been on this journey through theater, lifting as we climb. So I find joy that black women are organizing archives because it gives me a safe place. In those dark middle of the morning um, sessions, I find myself asking, um, who put this here and why? Having to interrogate that. But when I know that black women are organizing archives, I can just go to work. Thank you. Your work, your access, your visual presentations, the care, the concern speaks volumes to me, the lay person, the researcher, the creative. Digitize everything. The mundane is magnificent for the artist. That recipe card that I came across gave me fodder for my script. Props people can use it. We build sets around something that came out of a recipe card. So continue to do the work. I thank you and I am so glad that we are in community and doing this work. Thank you, Sharia. And now I'd like to open it up to all of you for your questions. Um, it's really nice to hear about the different ways that we're coming to the archives. So feel free to use the mic um, in the aisle, or we can also pass around a mic if that's more accessible. I have a question, a comment really first. Thank you, first of all, everyone. How's that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so first of all, thank you so much. And I love the, um, you know, the relationship between um, Jennifer talking about being in the archives and doing that work. And, and you said um, creating names if they were not in the LOC, right? 
And so that first, but like creating these names and making visible to us how, um, you know, how these structures can erase and the work that you have to do just to kind of get those words um, to us. And then um, Janelle talking about hidden curriculums, mm -hmm. you know, those hidden curriculums and, and what keeps these stories um, out of the classroom and how we bring them back in. And then, um, you know, Sharia talking about how did I not know? You know, how did I not know? And so thinking about, again, just the ways in which we all are coming together and entering this space um, in different ways to do this work. And so my question um, is, I guess if you can just talk a little bit about, um, you know, just to experience, um, you know, how, what does it feel like when you're doing the work in the archives? What does it feel like when you're encountering, um, you know, the recipe card? What does it feel like when you're um, looking for something or longing for something um, that that is either there or, or receding or um, absent, but or really, you know, present that you might not have expected? So just, just wondering if you could talk about what it feels like in your body um, mm -hmm. doing this work. This is soul work, so they're in when I'm in a uh, have been invited to in archives physically. Um, there is just connection with some of the things that I can touch, and um, but there's also a part of me that when I'm in um, the physical archives, I don't feel all the time welcome. And I feel a gaze, the gaze. So I'm not able to connect like I have been when I'm looking at these um, digital records and able to put things together on my own and commune with uh, the stories and the people that this information is about. I think it would be great uh, and just to think about having mentors for people who are not researchers. But uh, I walked in the first time to the archive and I was like, I have to keep all of my stuff out here? Like, why? Or just like, here are the rules of engagement. If you're going to go into a physical space, uh, I want to respect that. But I need to know. But it's very visceral. I would like to say um, one of the things I do, I did earlier in my career is process collections. When you process a collection, you get to know that the essence of the individuals, looking at their papers, touching their papers, reading. It is very intimate. And so um, it's something, that's why, um, excuse me, what was said before about getting to know the archivist in the archives is very, is very important. Um, when you go to an archives or prepare to go to the archives, it's very important to get as much information as you can and get to know the repository because it will help you in the long run. Because I'm not saying the archivists do that on purpose, but there are always little gems, little things in even related collections that they know about, that the archivists know about, that can help you on your journey. And so it's, it's just easier that way um, to develop a relationship and get to know those, the, the repository and also the archivist. And I also want to say that, I'm not trying to get emotional, but it was very rewarding today because I'm work, I work behind the scenes, you know, and to see and to listen to all this wonderful work that teachers, artists do with the exact same collections, but that is so diverse. And it's just rewarding for me as an archivist. So I just really want to thank you also for um, inviting me and also letting me enjoy this um, rewarding work that I do. I think for me, it feels like equity. Like this is equity right here for me, just because um, a lot of archives are held in place, like institutions that are not open to high school students or middle school students. Um, 
and there isn't always a bridge between the ivory tower and the black top of the schoolyard. And for my students to have access to that kind of information and that kind of work, because they are that brilliant, they just haven't had that access, that's what it feels like for me. Thank you. I think we have time for one more really, really fast question before we wrap up. Unless anyone else has a question. My question is probably not going to be fast, but I think that, no, I, I, I really, I think that we have to kind of touch on this before we transition, because earlier we heard Dr. Jones talk to us about the ethics of care, right? So what it means to bring flowers to the grave site. And here we are talking about asking for permission, right? And so I want us to ask, you know, a little bit about what do we do with archival ambiguity, right? So as we are approaching the archive and we're learning and we're, you know, um, using this information to tell these stories, we're also engaging a process of reinterpretation, of speculation. And so how do we grapple with that? I want to make sure that as we are talking about the arts and the archival process, that we're also talking about it as um, as a fluid movement, right, as a creative process. And so on one hand, my question is about dealing with both simultaneously, the research and the speculation. And then the other part of my question is about how do we teach that, right? How do we make sure that when we're teaching this history, we're also incorporating the artistic elements of this process and practice? Thank you. So it... The ambiguity is a great opportunity to teach perspective taking. Um, one of the things I found about I find about my students, particularly those that are excited about like history and movement, is they have a lot of opinions but no perspective. Um, they haven't done the reading, like they only understand things from their own perspective and they haven't explored other people's perspectives. So when we include context, we include this is a primary source from these people in this context at this time, what might have happened, what might it mean? It emphasizes the importance of perspective because coming from different walks of life, coming from different identities, even certain words have different meanings. When we look at the archives and we look at the fact, for example, one of the things we bring up is the fact that women aren't listed. Does that mean that women don't matter? When we talk about, in one of the lessons, we talk about the difference between a leader and an activist. And my kids very, very quickly picked up on the fact that leader is usually gendered. Leaders are usually men, but activists can be anybody. And I'm like, what does that mean? Because we're still gonna use both these words. So sometimes, again, I think, these are opportunities, but then also to use those skills. So again, I talked earlier about how we don't have the historical thinking skills anymore. Being very explicit about it. Saying, we're gonna do some perspective taking, we're gonna look at bias, we're gonna look at what it means when we use certain words, and taking that as a teachable moment. Um, that, that's how I address it. I think we have uh, time just for Sharia, I know that was directed toward you in a way, so it's oh, really yeah, fast. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an opportunity to interrogate everything. And in the theater space, that's what um, the kind of theater Sankofa does. Sankofa it just means, it, it literally, it's the principle of going back and getting everything, everything that is yours. And then you bring it into your present, you interrogate it, you own it, and you use it to move forward with purpose and power. So we spend a lot of time at the table, more, more time than other um, probably directors and theater companies interrogating everything. Well, thank you again. Um, thank you for joining us. And now I'd like to invite um, the introduction for our closing. Thank you. Can we give Janelle and Jennifer and Sharia one more round of applause? Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you. I am so moved and filled with just gratitude in the spirit a little bit right now, and I'm gonna try not to bust out crying when I announce this last. Um, and our closing, our closing artist and speaker, 
my dear, 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 dear mentor, Dr. Damaris B. Hill. So Damaris B. Hill is a poet, a creative scholar, a friend, and a trusted, fearless leader. She is an author of Breath Better Spent, Living Black Girlhood, A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing, The Incarceration of African American Women, From Harriet Tubman to Sandra Bland, The Fluid Boundaries of Suffrage and Jim Crow, Staking Claims in the American Heartland, and other works, okay? So her, her laundry list is long, okay? Her digital work includes Shut Up In My Bones, a 21st century poem. Similar to her creative process, Hill's scholarly research is interdisciplinary. Hill is a professor of English, creative writing, and African American studies at University of Kentucky, one of my alma maters, and she is a Morganite, my other alma mater, okay? And so we thank you, and we want to invite Damaris to the stage. Thank you. So how do I get into my slides? And really, if you can get me on a web page. Yeah, because I'm going to present from the web page. So this presentation is going to be accompanied by a web page. The address to the web page is www dot csu hill h i l l dot blogspot b l o g s p o t dot com big money big money big money here we go <laughs> all right this is us all right So I'm going to begin, as I always begin, with the work. This is an excerpt from a work in progress. Um, I'm working on a memoir now. And this short prose, lyrical prose piece is called Haints in the Hole, a Story of an Archive. It is my mother's birthday. She turned 75 in October of 2002. When I see her last name, her surname, her father's surname, on a map dated 1640, the memories of our life together stops. I'm alone in the archive at Brown University. I have more questions than answers in this space. I look to my left and my right I feel shame, joy, and anger. I'm in the archive, and I am in the archive. The 18th century chair looks authentic, like it was made of salvaged wood. I wonder what ship's wood the table is made from. Is it made from the planks of the Sally? On the way to Providence, Rhode Island in 1764, the chairs in this archive seem to have sprung from the wood on the floor like stocks of cannons. And now I am staring muzzle to muzzle of the lip of the cannon's bore. I am lip to lip with this 17th century map. The cartography of this map floats above the faces of my family members like the texture of thellum underneath laminate. I'm trying to make sense of it all. This body, this name, kinship and constructions of family in the space of empire. How do we make family from a commodified and fractured self, a commodified and parceled society? As a child of African diaspora, my ancestors are always with me. It is our way. It is not only, I'm sorry, it is a way not to be beholden to the colonial structures of family. In this space, I am an Arboros. I am in the archive. I am in the archive. I am a snake eating my own tail. When I was younger, people used to often call me dizzy. 
and they were not wrong. I, ha I have been plenty dizzy, looking lovingly at paintings and melted clocks created by a dizzy artist named Dolly, swinging and swaying to jazz tempos in a hip hop song, falling deeply in love with somebody else's lover, sleeping at the foot of the bed rather than the head. All of these things will let you know that I am dizzy. I can't keep a common sense of time. So when the 21st century self is coiled into the 18th century chair, looking at a 17th century map, dated 1640, at a time when England is at war with itself because a king thinks he's God, and there are less archives than money, I climb on the edge of this antique table, and I swan dive into this map furiously chasing what I want to know, the stories of my ancestors and the voice of kinship. I am listening and watching for the sonar, a bit of something to lead me back to the belonging, to a home in the shattered outer realms of an eroding empire. The archivist dips her face into the water, her eyes wide. She taps me. She tells me that I can't put my physical body my whole self into the archive, and I ask why not? It is deeper and warmer than the pool of American mythology that I have been gargling. She laughs and promises to bring me more 17th century archives and books when I'm finished with this map. I may never be finished with this map. In 2008, I believe I want pages, a writing life, and abandon most of what I own to become a literary disciple. I did not desire ink. Turns out that I desired blood. And in 2022, I find blood on the page, blood in the box of the archive. That is a small thing in a bigger box that is a library made of bricks that are a type of ledger that is list of spaces that are occupied and list of unpaid labor for the glorification of occupiers, these English occupiers that claim a victimhood at the hands of a king that gave him a land and a world that he does not know or own and permission to escape most of his commands. Did I want to know them, these ancestors? Was this collective memory of occupation, violence, and delusion the only grace that these religious refugees were offering to me? I have gobbled their lies like crumbs in a forest, leading me to a king who some of my ancestors know to be a cannibal. Ingesting these lies about grace numbs me to all I instinctively know of time and its cyclical nature. Black people that ingest the American mythology are in a constant state of potential energy in suspended tension by the actors and agents within the environment. In, in the American mythology, black people are forever imagining velocity, forever suspended in this space. Black people in the American reality know in every fiber of their being that black people are indeed kinetic energy in the American capitalist landscape. The tethered ram in the wilderness, the blood sacrifice in the mythology of the American dream, the energy that keeps it all moving, constantly in motion and co-opt. I hit the map like lightning. I am standing on the black sharp rock of Bermuda and overlooking the whales, not wanting to leave them. I can smell the lizard dashing in the devil's grass. My aunt's house is not pictured on the south of St. David's Lighthouse. None of what I know of the architecture of the 21st century is present. This map is worth more than the commodified values of my whole lot, meaning my family and my legacy. In the archive, I am holding curated histories. In my body, I am holding two empires tethered together by a bridge called my back, holding the yield of fields, 
holding and nursing a woman's baby that has had a whip fashion to match the bone inlay brush and mirror at her vanity. Holding children in my arms and my womb and at my knees, holding my hands open for the children and the lovers that were taken from me and those that I was ordered to forget, holding the recipes whispered to me so that I may remember how to call on the first gods to intercede on my situations, on my behalf, inhaling and holding the aromas of the futures, exhaling all that I do not have space for. Why I'm holding in this space that's holding me in contempt of my humanity in this archive, I'm obliged to know. What is the heavy weft of paper? What are the alchemies that can remedy the extractions of empire? My skin itches and feels like paper, like someone has put pepper in it. I want out of skin, and just for a moment to avoid the burning. I do not know if the burning is of the surface or of the soul. Was this? an unexpected inheritance. Was I to inherit the aerial powers of Elijah or another Sukiyong or Kalugwa? Am I entering my red stage of this early life or was I instinctively in danger, in fight or flight mode? Liberation is free. It is not a linear equation sitting on the line of time. I'm sorry, liberation is free, but it is not a linear equation sitting on a line of time. I do not want to be owned in body or in memory. I want to burn the archive. Of course, I, I, don't, I don't mean that. I would not burn an archive. <laughs> but in the moment, you know, I'm talking about, if you have fantasized about liberation and find yourself in a situation where you have to ask permission to get to know the, the memories of your ancestors, mm -hmm. you, you may not want the boundaries of an archive. So that was from Blood Bible that's coming out um, in 2025. My other books that I'm going to read from today, um, I'm gonna read just a little bit from Breath Brother Spent, uh, a tiny bit from A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing. I'm not reading from these two. Carmen's gonna ask me about that. <laughs> so I added it to the website. Um, and I'm gonna end with my digital poem, Shut Up In My Bones. For those that are on the socials, there's my website, there's my socials. Um, don't expect much interaction. I used to have a website person and now she has a real job. So I have to do all of my own social media and I do not have time for it often. Um, thank you so much for this invitation. Thank you for that introduction, Kesla. Thank you for all coming and sharing this draft with me. Again, I'm kind of going through my work backwards, starting with the most recent, um, and then descending into some of the earlier work. I'll begin, I, I, I really need my time, so I should be, right now I have about 19 minutes or 21 minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna read from Breath Better Spent, Living Black Girlhood. And I'll begin here with a poem entitled, Beloved Weirdo. You are not digging this book about a slave girl and her incidents. The pages read about her early knowing of all things. Meanwhile, you know you ain't got a stitch of sense. If you did, you would have put that book down and hit that boy asking you if your name is Beloved and if you're gonna be like Setha and kill the newborn baby he wants to put in you. Is he the weirdo watching in on you and your bestie leaving the woman's clinic? You wish you would have gone wild as the wind on him for prying. Instead, you go deaf and dumb thinking on it. 
your mind wanders into a book. You think on asking, Miss Harriet Jacobs, how does a girl learn to be a slave? Does a snake bite you and leak venom until you fall crippled and spasm, zombie you into a slave? If no, then you gotta swallow a butterfly and let it flutter in your throat, smother your words until you become a slave. Do you let the butterfly kick you way up into your tonsils? This might make your eyes rummage the floor for cracks and force you to be humble. Can a slave be made from a butterfly that avoids the windows, avoids light? Does the butterfly become a bat under the girl's collar? Or do you crawl under the hoof of a horse named Andrew Jackson to become a slave? The horse galloping and neighing at your earlobe, at your earlobe earlobes, excuse me, dirt in with the blood. To be a slave, would you take your ribs and fashion Andrew Jackson's hooves with ivory shoes? Would the overseers use your teeth to tether, hold Andrew Jackson's shoes in like nails? In the cradle of your black ringing neck, do you offer the nag a pedestal and curtsy at the mayor's master? Just curious, not dying enough. So um, Breath Better Spent Living Black Girlhood is a, a look at my individual girlhood, the girlhood of some historical figures, um, and in, in a, as a means of illustrating what is really missing from culture when black girls go missing. And so the book ends um, with a series of poems dedicated to the girls of Borno um, in Nigeria that were kidnapped after um, completing their physics exams. So I wanna point out, I know I don't have time for this, but I must say it. You must understand that the kidnapping of the girls was not merely a kidnapping um, for a comfort woman or sexual pleasure. The, the people that kidnapped these girls all understood that these girls intended to be doctors. So if you are a militia and you're living in harsh environments, you want a comprehensive wife, right? You don't want an ornamental wife. And so we have to start looking at women and children as prisoners of wars and as warriors with different skills, because war doesn't only happen to men. Bring back our girls' premonition three. Before the rocket's red glare over the oceans in Pearl Harbor, generations worth of Korean girls were tossed from chairs and desks, taken from schools and thrown into brothels. There, one soldier, sometimes five, sometimes 60, uses your body to dress the wounds not decorated with his blood. A Korean girl, you will not stop running. Doctors half your age will diagnose you with sleepwalking, tell you that it is dangerous for your mind to list the names when your heart wishes the worst deaths. You shut your eyes. Daughters rock themselves when they hear grandmothers snoring, see grandmothers kicking at the air, swinging canes into houseplants before they go tender into their quilts. There is always one left to recount the tales, else a war and its ways may have never really happened. The tree dropping in the forest far away, let's say Nigeria, let's say Borno, without anyone around to hear is a kind of mystery. So I'm gonna read one poem from A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing, and then we're gonna play. So I'm gonna read um, this poem, and I've read it a few times, but I think it most articulates archival and digital play. So this is a poem about Harriet Tubman, and to tell you the truth about their creative process, I had about 15 or 16 poems about Harriet Tubman <laughs> because I couldn't, um, I thought I was getting it right and I was writing about the spaces she occupied and the dates and the geography because I'm kind of into maps. 
And then I realized the whole gag with Harriet Tubman, her superpower was you could not find her. And so I had, you know, content and craft are always in conversation. So I had to create the poem where she was present, but you couldn't exactly locate her in an exact space. And so that's what this poem attempts to do. And so you can prayerfully, this is what I aim, you can enter the poem in any space and it rings true. So I'm going to read the poem two different ways and we're going to, you know, experiment with that. So Harriet is holy. Uh, I'm going to read it snake up and down first. Harriet is holy. Look at the water women. My mark as faithful as her face. A collection be no mysteries. Waist deep and wet in like braille. These sweet waters call. Even Jesus needed her. Hold hands to the wind. Take me, Miss Tubman, in tow. X, daughter of Eve, a rainbow wonder of stars of springs. I know of no man in the, these crossings, bold in her feet, in her palms. Her Moses, a John the Baptist, she in the intersections. What is it about her instructions make? A river bee, mother of Cain, her smile between water, between women, stands. Mossy riverbeds, this woman needs thousands. Ask the stars with arms wide, she be revolver and rescue. So I'm going to go another way. Let me figure out how I'm... Hmm. Okay, I'm going to read, probably start with She Be Revolver Rescue and read counter reading rationale. Um, she Be Revolver Rescue, she in the intersections, her, even Jesus needed, a John the Baptist with arms wide, ask the stars, her Moses, call these sweet waters in her palms, thousands this woman needs, fold in her feet like braille, waist deep and wet in these crossing, mossy riverbeds, stands. I know of no man, be no mysteries, a collection of stars of springs between water, between women, her smile, a rainbow wonder, her face as faithful as daughter of Eve, mother of Cain, a river be X, my mark. Water, women, take me, Miss Tubman, in tow. Her instructions make. What is it about? Hold hands to the wind. Look at them. And so I'm going to end with a digital poem. Um, this poem was composed in 2017. I'm going to ask you. Um, for a little bit of grace. The first three and a half minutes is very slow. It teaches you how, it, well, it's training your brain how to interpret the poem. And the second three and a half minutes, you will see it's very saturated with uh, a numerous amount of archives from many different sources to articulate the poem. What you should know before I begin this poem is it's the opening poem of a bound woman is a dangerous thing. And it's about uh, the life I share with my grandmother. My grandmother was diagnosed schizophrenic, but everyone talks about that she was the smartest of all her siblings. And she wanted to be a librarian, but she got married to a man that the nation state and the army needed. So she lived all over the world. And in the 50s, she was unable to get a degree like most of her siblings. Um, and now I read for a living. But um, I still don't know who got the better end of the deal. So I hope you can hear it. Shut up in my bones. For my grandmother, Harriet Beecher Sproul Hill. I have the racket of anxiety in my genes. It rivets in ink. Spite this, 
I leave these marks, this evidence of us undone. In wit's end, it all ferments, and we shape totems of shame from our amusements. The musk of my imagination is as redolent as any untamed woman, and likewise mistaken for mental illness. Perfection is a mask, a perfume in my pulse. I learn to hide what is feared. To be literate is to pen oneself with noodles. Shape beauty from a funhouse mirror. This is how artists learn the craft of display. Call this confession a lie. Look closer. I stubbed my toe, tight rope walking, the lashes of circus clowns. Only the liberated can see the legacies of bondage stirring beyond the ribbons. I have come to know I am the savory morsel in America's teeth. These words are clawed into the enamel. My face is familiar among the haints. I wear her likeness like a call. See, I had a grandma who could read lightning speeds. Now some holy ghost. The best life had for her was this country's secondhand soldier, a loving husband, no room for books and babies at her breast. The sanctified think marriage is a type of reward if you are a second generation out of slavery, color of coffee being a type of woman, and your hair is some black lacquer of unruly licorice that has branches that wave like echoes. Her smile, whiter than seashells, her breath, the scent of tobacco, as narrow as a Carolina pine with the worries about the rage of white folks. She died gifting me her photos, the only story she would write. At birth, her name becomes my velvet slick heirloom, tufted behind my mother's. It is costly to stay free and appear sane. I am she and an extravagant kind, a shimmy spilling from her buttons, the erotic unbridled, a glimmer riding the golden. I am her shrill of laughter, clapping in doubt. Curiosity is a coy friend, chaos my alter ego. I mistook a jagged molar for an ivory tower, and I ain't got the good sense God gave me to rot. Once more, lady. Shut up in my bones. For my grandmother, Harriet Beecher Sproul Hill. I have the racket of anxiety in my genes. It rivets in ink. Despite this, I leave these marks, this evidence of us undone. In wit's end, it all ferments, and we shape totems of shame from our amusements. The musk of my imagination is as redolent as any untamed woman and likewise mistaken for mental illness. Perfection is a mask, a perfume in my pulse. I learn to hide what is feared. To be literate is to pen oneself with noodles. Shape beauty from a funhouse mirror. This is how artists learn the craft of display. Call this confession a lie. Look closer. I stubbed my toe, tight rope walking, the lashes of circus clowns. She was a genius. She really was. I'm telling Only the liberated can see the legacies of bondage stirring beyond the ribbons. I have come to know 
I am the savory morsel in America's teeth. These words are clawed into the enamel. My face is familiar among the haints. I wear her likeness like a call. See, I had a grandma who could read lightning speeds. Now some Holy Ghost. The best life had for her was this country's secondhand soldier, a loving husband. No room for books and babies at her breast. The sanctified think marriage is a type of reward if you are a second generation out of slavery, color of coffee bean type of woman, and your hair is some black lacquer of unruly licorice that has branches that wave like echoes. Her smile, whiter than seashells. Her breath, the scent of tobacco, as narrow as a Carolina pine with the worries about the rage of white folks. She died gifting me her photos, the only story she would write. At birth, her name becomes my velvet slick heirloom, tufted behind my mother. It is costly to stay free and appear sane. I am she and an extravagant kind, a shimmy spilling from her buttons, the erotic unbridled, a glimmer riding the golden. I am her shrill of laughter, clapping in doubt. Curiosity is a coy friend, chaos my alter ego. I mistook a jagged molar for an ivory tower, and I ain't got the good sense God gave me to rot. She was a genius. <laughs> so thank you for your time. If you need to, please get up because you do have to disrupt energy. Um, I purposely write with the intention of having the audience know the experiences of having a marked body in a hostile place. So that tension you're feeling is very intentional. <laughs> so you may want to get up and like disrupt it and shake it off. Or you just may want to take a minute. Thank you. And to see him here now, hi, Dr. Gilliam. <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, before we close out, we want to keep going with the format that we have been using. So if anyone has any questions, we do have the mic stand right here in the front. So feel free to get up, as Dr. Hill suggested and share your question at the mic stand. If you cannot get up, you can simply raise your hand if you have a question that you'd like to ask Dr. Hill. We do want to save a few minutes just for some dialogue. And originally, as she knows, I was gonna ask her a question about visual textures, which is her, uh, is it 2015? 2015 chat book. Chat book. Um, and one of the reasons why I wanted to start there, which I, I won't, but I guess I'm starting there anyways, um, is because she uses the digital humanities and or fuses digital humanities and creative expression. Um, for example, she uses the GPS technology that was available, so she talks a lot about how much she really loves maps, right? Um, in order to think about the ways in which land has been ruptured. Um, in the process of colonial world making, right? And so I just wanted to start by um, saying that that is available for you to look at online, right? Because she was doing some of the work in which we talk about in terms of um, fusing the archives in, in creative expression in a digital format way before we even started having this conversation, right? And we talked about a little bit, um, because Dr. Hill is, is, is such a great mentor and friend to me, um, about the ways in 
which early on that may not have been something that was so promoted, right? And so we hope that by the end of today, you understand why that work is necessary. So I just wanted to, to start our conversation off by shouting you out and shouting that book out and saying that it is available for you to check out online. However, after, after listening to that presentation, if you feel anything like what I feel, um, I want to redirect the conversation a little bit, right? Because one of the things that you are exposing us to is poetry through form, mm -hmm. right? And you do so with this experimentation that we see with this contrapuntal, if you will, okay? Now, if you don't know, that's a vocabulary word. You can check that out. Um, it, is a, it, is, it is a poetic form, but really quickly, just for the sake of time, I, wanna, I would like for you to talk to us um, about what I see as this very symbiotic relationship between not just content and form, but also form and archives, right? Because when I think about what form does in poetry is that we have this container in which content is able to um, exist within and resist out of, right? And so when I think about that, I think about the ways in which we are also dealing with limitations, right? Some of these limitations that we've explicitly been talking about um, in terms of accessing the archives, right? So how is it that you are able to create these these very jarring and yet voice these very beautiful um, poetic language using form um, while digging through the archives and, and experiencing the, the sort of erasures and violences that's happening there. Can you talk to us a little bit about that symbiotic relationship? I can speculate, <laughs> but I'll, I'll attempt to answer your question. And I think part of that um, it's very much rooted in a subcultural identity. Um, speaking of Richard Allen in Philadelphia, my family is very, very, very AME. I'm one of the few people in my family that does not have an MDiv and that is not a pastor. I am going to heaven. I'm taking the scenic route. <laughs> Many of you can join me if you'd like. But I say this to say that um, the formal constructions of hymns and listening to various sermons and interpretations of metaphor and simile, and those things were probably introduced to me in the church. So naturally, when I became a poet, and you know, the way my little um, secret or not so secret A-type personality is set up, I was really in love with form for like seven years, like really in love with form, could write in any form. I still love form, it's still kind of, you know, it's still kind of erotic for me. But the pleasure I receive breaking form is greater. So then I began experimenting with disrupting form. And um, I haven't gone back. So in A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing, I, I do use a lot of formal poetic uh, forms to illustrate or to kind of echo the, the content and the state of the women being incarcerated. Okay, I'll, I'll follow up. I see we have a, a sign that's telling us that we need to get up out of here. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I do want to take a moment to um, sit with this idea of haunting, right? It shows up in your poetry, but it also is part of the content in which the speakers of your poem are trying to convey, right? And so where do you situate um, this feeling, right, this idea, this conception of haunting, both within the archives and within writing about the archives. Yes, to echo again one of our um, panelists from earlier, um, I not only um, don't really believe in linear time as um, a concrete fact of life, but I do believe in an African diaspora sense of time. That is Sankofa. But I also believe in the African principles 
and that other cultures adapt, that our ancestors are always with us. So I'm very intentional in a lot of my work, which is much easier in poetry, to collapse time and bring the 21st century and the historical period that I'm referencing in, in, in very close community and fluid boundary with an Afro future. So even in the memoir that I'm writing now, each of the chapters has to have a moment that it's collapsing. So I'm talking very much about early America and about American history in the context of me trying to get to know what home is in this commodified and fractured and pragmatic space. But the mythology that I was given is not a justifiable explanation. I need to access um, other knowledge systems and technologies. And I can only do that type of access by collapsing time. Well, thank you so, so, so much. One of the reasons I love poetry and I love your poetry is that, you know, as you are talking about that collapsing of time and talking about the ruptures, you remind us that there is intimacy and there's vulnerability, right? Um, and that there is very existence in there. And so as we think about and utilize these words like rupture and violences, right? It's equally important that I think the arts, right, lends itself to also thinking about the humanity that is involved in all of that, right? As we talk about black resistance, we're also talking about black joy, right? And I'm, I'm thinking of June Jordan, another poet, so I just want to thank you once again for sharing that lovely presentation with us, for sharing your poetry with us. And I want to remind everyone here um, in the audience that the speakers will be around right after. So if you have any questions and didn't get a chance to ask them on the mic, you can feel free to ask them afterwards. And I'll leave the website out for a little while if you want to go back and check it out before I clean my pocket. Thank you so much. Green has just been so wonderful. Um, let's keep the round of applause going to thank all of our speakers. Again, Dr. Maida Jones, Dr. Damaris Hill, our panelists, Jennifer Morris, Janelle Moore Amon, Sharia Ben, and our moderators as well. So Carmen Wong, Kessa Elmore, and Lauren Barnes for leading us through an engaging discussion about black women's material, materials and archives and the ways, really the different ways of engaging this material and being able to make meaning out of it. We want to take a moment to highlight some of the ongoing work that's happening at BWA. So our digital maps are now live on our website, bwaproject.org. We encourage you to check it out. Oh, okay, well, give me one second, because you need to see these digital maps. It was previewed uh, with Dr. Meta Jones, but you need to see these maps. Okay, here we go, the digital maps. Um, this project offers a visual representation of the scattered nature of black women's archival materials and locates repositories dispersed throughout North America for each of our featured women. We wanna take a moment to celebrate Takina and Kendra, please stand. <laughs> We want to thank you for all of your work to make this launch happen. We also want to give a very special thank you to Lauren Cooper, who has guided us through this process with such grace. And to Dr. Sabrina Evans, who's also on the data visualization team with us. It was so wonderful to see Dr. Jones use the map in her presentations. You know, this is what we hope for. This is the type of engagement and uh, the tool that we hope that this map can be. So check it out on our website. We also wanna give you a preview of what's coming next. Uh, BWA is partnering with uh, Legacy, a foundational journal uh, focusing on women writers. Uh, the special issue will be guest edited by Drs. Uh, Moody Turner and 
Sabrina Evans, as well as myself. You can find more information uh, and a call for papers on our website as well. Uh, the special issue will feature literary scholars, early career researchers, creative artists, and archivists to demonstrate the fruitfulness of black women's archival materials for research, community engagement, and digitization efforts uh, to, to illuminate the expansiveness both intellectually and geographically of black women's writing and community organizing during this period. We also hope to include poetic engagements uh, with BWA archival materials. This multi-generic format of the forum will be representative and a model for the innovative collaboration and work of BWA. And so I want to take a moment to thank everyone that is here today. Clap for yourselves. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for joining in on the live stream. Again, thank you to our speakers. Uh, this is our BWA team. Thank you all so much for all of your work on stage, behind the scenes, and making this event happen. This is a picture of us at Tempshuous Element, uh, a play about Anna Julia Cooper, and then also a picture down here on Zoom to show that we've been doing this work during the pandemic, virtually, in person, um, and continuing to do it. Uh, thank you to our faculty director, Dr. Shirley Moody Turner. This event is a brainchild of hers, and it's so ha we're just so excited to see it come to fruition. Uh, thank you to Dr. Foreman, the co-director of Center CBDR, Dr. Casey, uh, Summer Hamilton, Jenna Sassi, the PSU Broadcasting for working with us to make this happen so we could live stream. Again, the BWA team and CBDR team, Lauren Cooper, Gabby Sutherland, Sergio Kermana, Bolin Allen, thank you, Courtney Murray, uh, the Hub Robeson uh, events team. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And of course, thank you to our sponsors, CBDR again, the Just Transformation, uh, Mellon Grant, the College of Liberal Arts, and Dean Lang, and PSU Libraries. I will now turn it over to our faculty director, Dr. Moody Turner, to close us out. Thank you everyone for being here today with us. Um, when What came to me through all of this is that we really are working in the tradition and in the legacy of the women who we write about and work, you know, do our work dedicated to um, thinking about the ways in which they, Anna Julia Cooper, and Mary Church Terrell, and countless others named, not named people who, you know, we have published and recognized and people who are my grandmother, you know, have been doing this work, um, you know, preserving the print archives, the sonic archives, the visual archives, the aesthetic archives, doing all of this work. And um, everyone here today just really gave us such a wonderful, um, you know, chance to embrace and be with that work um, and to really think about the, the many ways we can um, do this in collaboration and community. But I especially want to give a big thank you to our co-chairs of today's event, um, Tesla Elmore and Lauren Barnes. If you could come up and get your flowers. <laughs> They have worked so hard and they deserve their flowers and so much more. <laughs> and thank you all for coming. Um, I don't know if anyone has any last words or if everyone is ready to get up and move around and do you have any last words? Oh, you have a last word? Okay, we have a last word. I won't have the last word. I will say thank you and I will sit down and thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dr. Foreman. I do have one last word. We were talking last night. I'm sorry, you know. No, I won't take the last word. I just have one last word. But we were talking last night and, and Keith might remember this when we used to do the Celebrating African American Literature Conferences. And I would always thank every single person in the AF Amlet cohort because the person, when you are pulled away and you are doing the work of organizing a conference, that means that everybody else in your department and in your you know, area are having to do all of that work to buttress the work that you're doing or the work that you're not doing when you're pulled away to, to do something else. And so I just wanna give a big, huge thank you um, to Dr. Foreman 
who has been, you know, guiding us in so many ways um, through this work and has allowed me to be over here doing this and she's doing all of this and, you know, we just couldn't do this without you. Um, and you have done, you know, we, we know, we know all the work that happens behind the scenes to make something like this possible. Um, so thank you very much uh, to Dr. Foreman. We'll have a collaborative last word. So I just really wanted to thank you um, for, for joining in this conversation um, and thank you to Kesla, my co-chair. Um, this is even better than we imagined it and it was truly a wonderful conversation and we really wanna keep the conversation going. Um, so we will, um, you know, be in contact and follow us on Twitter too to keep the conversation going. Um, and thank you all for making this possible today. Thanks again. That's at B W O A underscore project. That's our that's our Twitter handle. Thank you. <laughs>